Hello there. I wanted to talk to you about this um, World War I aerial combat game called Wings of Glory. Um, now, I realise it's quite an old game now, so a lot of people are going to be familiar with it, but I've recently um, uh, been drawn back to it by something that uh, I've discovered. So I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit later. Um, but first of all, a little bit about the history of this game. Um, it's called Wings of Glory, but its first incarnation um, was this game here called Wings of War. Uh, it's a game that's written by uh, two Italian people, Andrea Angelino and Pier Giorgio Paglia. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, now, in the game, um, it's a really nice pick-up-and-play game um, in that you get, in the basic box, uh, a set of walls, uh, sets of tokens, uh, two measurement markers. This is to measure ranges and so on for gunfire. And four sets of um, damage cards, what are called damage cards. So there's A, B, and C and D in there. Um, but no planes and no cards that you can use to represent the planes. And that is the big difference, really, between this set and the original Wings of War. And that in Wings of War, um, you actually got cards that represented the planes um, if you didn't want to buy the models. And you also got some generic manoeuvre cards. I'll explain a bit more about those a little bit later. Um, but since it was um, purchased, I think it's an American company that bought it, bought it up, um, and reintroduced it as Wings of Glory. Since then, you now have to have to buy the model planes. And um, in the UK, they're a little bit. Uh, variable in price. These are some of the types of planes that you can buy. Um, now you can see on here, or well, you might be able to see, um, I picked this one up recently at Vatnatak in York um, and it was on sale from a company called Northumbria Games. They were charging £11.50 for the model um, which was is a very good price in the UK. Um, these two ones here uh, I purchased at Warfare in Reading, I think the year before last, um, from Caliber Books, and this one was seventeen pound fifty. This one eighteen pounds. Um, if you go to the American uh, official website for Wings of Glory, um, which is called uh, Wings of Glory Aerodrome. And its website is www.wingsofwar.org. So I think they've kept that website name um, from the original title of the game. Um, you can actually pick up these models, um, or this one certainly, uh, for $9.99, um, which would be what, about six pounds something like that equivalent i'm not entirely sure but a lot cheaper so it's worth looking at that website and possibly buying them over the internet and paying the price of the international shipping and you could get them a little bit cheaper and also it's much easier doing it that way because they're not easy to find now um at vapnatak where i purchased this one Northumbria Games was the only company there selling them. The Caliber books were there. I, I must admit, I didn't look too hard um, because I'd, I'd already purchased things from Caliber that I thought were a little bit pricey. Um, but I don't think Caliber was selling them at York this year. 
Um, so they are a little bit hard to find. So the website is probably going to be your best means of, of getting hold of the models. But anyway, what do you get? Um, in the box, you receive the model itself. Now, this is one of the um, great selling points of this game, I think, because the models are wonderful. Um, they are pre-painted, which puts some people off, I suppose. I'll put this on its stand so you can get a better idea without my hands in the way. Um, but there's nothing to stop you painting these models up yourself. Um, some people have a kind of aversion to games, similar one in X-Wing, where um, the models come pre-painted. It takes away part of the fun of the hobby, which, yeah, it does, but... Um, I've seen on on um, the Wings of Glory Aerodrome site there is a forum and people do some fantastic paint jobs on their their models um, and it's a it's a good subject to paint because the um, fighter pilots of the day had wonderful kind of specific designs for their own planes. So this is um, an albatross um, which was flown by Ernst Udert, so it's in his colours and I think you can see on there what a, it's a fantastic job they've done I mean personally my painting skills are rubbish so I would never be able to achieve something like that anyway um, so you can basically pick it up and play as I say um, Ernst Udert also as well I've got a sort of particular interest in this character. He was a famous uh, German ace of the First World War. Um, he survived the war and um, in the 1920s uh, was a little bit down on his luck. So um, he did a lot of stunt flying, as a great many um, uh, pilots of the First World War did. Um, and he had incredible skill. I've actually seen footage of him flying a plane and picking up a piece of handkerchief or something like that about a couple of feet square with the tip of the wing of his plane being able to fly that close to the ground um, but unfortunately he was a bit of a flawed character as well um, great playboy and uh, I think it's sort of reasonable to say he was probably an alcoholic by the end of his life um, and uh, he was uh, courted, really, by the Nazis because he had such a prestigious name. And he joined the Nazi party in the 30s and um, under Goering's uh, patronage, really, because Goering had also been a, a fighter pilot during the First World War. And um, he was persuaded uh, to... Uh, help Goering really, he was one of Goering's under um, under staff in the Luftwaffe uh, he was responsible primarily for the Luftwaffe adopting the Stuka dive bomber um, which was a plane after his own heart really because she had to dive the plane so steeply and so close to the ground that it required a great deal of skill and courage to do it um, but as the war progressed, he found himself increasingly under pressure uh, because of the Luftwaffe's poor performance and Goering um, treated him quite badly as well and he basically um, declined into a sort of drunken um, stupor really and eventually took his own life uh, before the war ended um, so he, it was a bit of a sad end to the brave man. Um, anyway, back to the game. Um, so, what you get with each box plane set that you get is the plane itself, four pegs which are altitude markers. So these will separate. Out, gosh, these will separate out. Planes are fairly robust as well, as you can see. Um, these will separate out, so you can reduce the altitude of the plane down by stages and the stand itself is um, engraved with the 
fire arc of the um, forward firing machine gun and a number of other markers including the details of the, the plane's type, um, the armament that it carried and its uh, damage points. Um, and you also get a set of cards. You get the car a similar card that I was showing you earlier that you you get four of those I think in the Wings of War box, but none in the Wings of Glory. And this is kind of interchangeable with the stand. Um, same size, has the same details on it. And you sometimes need in the game when planes are overlapping on the board, they don't Unless you're playing the advanced rules, they don't collide, so you have to replace one of the stands with a card so that you can fit them onto the same space on the table. Um, and you also get a set of the manoeuvre cards that I was talking about earlier. Now, this is one of the nice things about the game, that each playing type um, has its own specific manoeuvre cards, um, and you play three of these at a time, um, but... Because they're specific to the plane type, you'll find that you're sometimes limited in the number of tight turns that you can do, uh, particularly in one direction, because the torque of the engine rotation, as it were, um, kind of uh, persuaded the plane to go in one direction, so it was harder to turn, I think, to the left than the, to the right in most planes. Um, and also the speeds of the plane would vary, so this forward manoeuvre card here um, might be a shorter length, um, depending on the speed of the plane. And what you do is um, you, play, you, you choose three cards, three manoeuvre cards per turn that you're going to use, and you have the plane on the table, so that's the plane. You put the... Um, I don't know if you can make it out, there's a grey line there, it's this black line here. So you put the card in front of the plane and then you move it so that that arrow at the back there overlaps with that arrow and then you take the card away. Um, now in the original rules uh, you may have noticed that you get uh, these um, boards here that you can put um, the manoeuvre cards face down and you can also put uh, the damage cards that you accumulate there the various tokens here, your pack of cards, uh, manoeuvre cards that you're not using there and the plane type card there um, and that's one thing where I don't think the Wings of Glory box set is quite as good um, because the similar, the similar thing you get in that box set, I think I've got them underneath here because I so rarely use them, are these things here, which, um, it's upside down, and you're supposed to put the cards in, um, in here like that, but if you're playing on the table, it's much harder to move that around, get them out of the way, whereas this acts like a kind of tray, um, so I tend to take these out of the old box set, and play the current Wings of Glory game and ignore these these things here. But if you look on the um, the official website, you can actually on the Wings of Glory Aerodrome, you can buy plastic and perspex stands, all kinds of accessories, um, as well as the planes themselves. And you can also buy mats. Um, this mat that I've got on the table here is from Hots artworks I think they're called but there are some really nice um, but although expensive uh, gaming mats that you can use and that you can purchase from the website but you can just put you can play on anything really any table size um, you can play on a bit of blue sheet to represent sky um, right so the thing that I have discovered recently um, and the reason I've got back into the game is that um, I've been f I haven't been playing a great deal with with opponents recently. I'm not getting much chance to play war games, but um, I've discovered that there is a solo version of this game. 
Um, it's by a guy called Richard Bradley, um, and he's a member of the Tyneside War Games Club. Um, so you can find this solo version free to download at the Tyneside War Games Club website, which is tynesidewargames.co.uk. And um, Richard Bradley's also got a blog of his own, which is called Herky Bird's Nest. And that's at Blogspot. It's herkybird-richardbradley.blogspot.co.uk. Um, but he is, Richard, this guy Richard Bradley has done an immense amount of work um, to produce a kind of uh, solo game where, let me get another plane out, I can demonstrate it to you. So this is a Sopwith triplane. So say, for instance, I was playing the German side. Um, so I am going to make deliberate choices for manoeuvre cards for the um, albatross there. And the, the opponent's side is going to have to be played um, with some kind of artificial intent intelligence. So I would choose my manoeuvre cards first of all place them on my board, and then um, on the Tyneside War Games website you can download these two arcs here. So depending on which side um, my plane is to the opponent, um, you put this arc down here which fits over the base stand. And incidentally you can buy these in Perspex form from the official website. So they obviously they were so impressed by them that they've taken up Richard Bradley's idea. And then you look to see which zone um, the actual flight stand's peg is in relation to this plane. And it's in zone 9. Now um, the plane type is U which means it, it requires the U manoeuvre deck. Um, and you can print off, for every plane type, you can print off this set of options. So this is U here. So it's in zone 9. So I look at this one here. I roll a dice. 1 and 2, I choose those three manoeuvre cards. 3 and 4, I choose those three. And 5 and 6, those three. And it works really well. Um, the, the only things you can't do, um, you can't bring some of the more advanced rules into play, such as altitude. There's no choice of um, no choice of climbing or diving. Um, any specific damage that this plane takes, other than the plane exploding, isn't taken into account. By which I mean you can get damage such as a rudder damage that stops you turning left or right, one or the other. Um, and in this solo game you have to ignore that because the dice roll might decide that you're going to turn right even when the rudder damage would have prevented you. So um, you don't bother with that. And um, the only other things really that you can't do, um, for instance if you wanted to do an Immelman turn, which is where you go forward, up, flip over and then back the way you came. Um, if you're playing uh, a normal game and your last manoeuvre of the turn you can go straight forward and then that counts as you being then in the first part of your next turn being able to flip over. But with this choice of um, so that's here. See if I can find an Immelman turn. Yeah, there's an Immelman turn there. So you go forward, flip over, go back, and then go forward again. You can't you can't do that flip over as the first part of your turn um, as the artificial intelligence, whereas you can as a normal player. So you're slightly limited in that respect. Um, and the only other thing I've found, I've had some really good games of this playing playing solo. Um, 
And the only other thing I've found is it doesn't really take into account the urgency of how close the enemy plane is to you. Um, obviously, if you were miles away, you might think about doing a more um, gentle manoeuvre than if the plane was right up close to you, and it doesn't seem to take that into consideration. But I haven't found it a problem. And as I say, I've played several games now um, where I've pitted myself, say, against a couple of enemy planes, and I've had some really close and exciting games. Um, so I've filmed or taken some shots of one game that I played, and I've had a little bit of fun um, turning it into an animated uh, short movie, um, which I'll play to you at the end of this. Um, but bear in mind when you watch it that this is just me playing solo, um, and it was an incredibly close game. Um, practically nothing in it, really well balanced, and um, that's all done through Richard Bradley's mechanism. So I can highly recommend you looking at that and downloading it and getting into this game. It's great fun. So I think that's everything I wanted to say about this game. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy the, um, the little animation. And I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.